Will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our everlasting Redeemer. Amen. One of the things you discover as you read through the pages of the Bible is that time and time again, the Bible records how God speaks to God's people. It begins very early. In fact, in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, we are told that the very first act of God was to speak. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void and deep covered the face of the earth. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Later, after God had created the heavens and the earth, and and after God had given birth to humanity, uh, we're told that God shared conversations with Adam and Eve and Cain and Noah and Abraham and Moses and Elijah and a whole host of, of others. One day, a young man sat in a worship service, not unlike the one we're in today, and God spoke. God asked a question. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the young man said, I'll go. And the ministry of Isaiah began. Of course, nowhere in the Bible is it recorded that God spoke more clearly than God did in a manger in Bethlehem. It was there in that manger in Bethlehem that a child was born. And as that child grew and and, and into adulthood and became a man. He said and did things, and through the things that he said and did, the world heard God as it had never heard before, as the Gospel of John tells us. It was in him that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and full of truth. But the Bible not only records instances when God speaks to God's people, the Bible also tells us of many times when God remains silent. In fact, ironically enough, it is often to the very people to whom God once spoke that he later remained silent. Abraham and God had shared many conversations together, but it was when Abraham took his son, his only son Isaac, and he headed up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, that God remained silent. It was in that moment when more than anything else, Abraham wanted to hear a word from God that there was no word. Eventually, God did speak, but not until there had been a long, painful time of quiet. The prophet Elijah had something of the same experience. God and Elijah had shared some conversations, and it was after Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal that Elijah, we find him curled up in a cave. And what he wants more than anything else is a word, just some word from from God He looks for a word when a wind goes by, but there is no word. An earthquake happens, and he prays that this is the moment when God will speak, but there is no word. A fire comes, but still no word. Only silence. Only silence. Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us that in reference to God, the Hebrew phrase, Hester Penham, the hiding of the face occurs more than 30 times in the Bible. And part of the implication is not only that there are times when God chooses to hide God's face, but there are also times when God chooses not to speak. In our lesson this morning, uh, we encounter an individual who seems to be going through this experience. He is broken and defeated Scholars tell us that in all probability, the 42nd Psalm was written following the exile, which means that he had witnessed the very center of his nation's spiritual life, the temple destroyed. He had seen many of 
the country's leading citizens carried off to a, a foreign land, and, and his country is now facing a new normal. He craves, he just craves just a word from God. He feels like a, a panting deer standing over a, a, a dry creek. Just, just one lap of water would be all that it would take. But short of the voice of the detractors taunting him and asking him, where is your God? There is only silence. And for him, for him it is the silence of God that is even more difficult to deal with than the situation that he is facing. Have you ever had an experience like that? Maybe you have. There are many occasions when we can have this kind of experience. Some of you who are friends and family of those whose names have been called this morning may be having that experience right now. And if you have ever had it, if you are having it now, then you know that sometimes dealing with the silence of God is more difficult than when God speaks. Yes, when God speaks... God sometimes challenges us, sometimes rebukes us, sometimes asks us to do things that we do not want to do. But it is the silence of God that raises the questions, the difficult and painful questions such as, does God really exist? And if God does exist, does not God care? Or is God just impotent? Years ago, I had an experience that brought this home to me. I was in high school. I played football for a high school team that was pretty consistently in contention for the regional and sometimes even the state title, which meant that we had a lot of really good football players on our, our team. I'm not sure how it is now, but back then, coaches yelled a lot. And sometimes... Their language would pass FCC regulations, but often their language would not pass FCC regulations, and I got yelled at a lot. I remember one time in particular, I just had one of those weeks where I just seemed to mess up everything. I missed blocks that I should have made. I mixed up some of the plays, and, and I just did one thing after another. I just couldn't seem to get anything right. And at one point during that week, Coach Underwood turned to me, and he said, Brown, I give up on you. I'm tired of even trying to correct you. And for the next several days, it didn't matter what I did. If I did something right, he said nothing. If I did something wrong, he said nothing. He just shook his head. I tried harder and harder because worse than being yelled at is being ignored and feeling as if you are forgotten, but there was just silence. The good news is that a few days later, I messed up again and Coach Underwood couldn't help himself. He started yelling at me in all sorts of ways. And the whole time, I couldn't help but just smile back at him as he yelled at me. Now, please don't push this illustration too far. I'm not implying that God stands over us and is constantly yelling at us. But what I am suggesting is that the silence of God can sometimes be the deepest pain that a person can experience. Because the soul is the place out of which all of life is ultimately lived, because the soul is the place of our deepest satisfaction, it is also the soul that can experience the deepest pain. However, as the psalmist alludes to at the end of this 42nd psalm, and as mystics like St. John of the Cross and others suggest, it is also the silence of God that can become the place of our greatest spiritual growth. If we will face it right, if we will not reject it, if we will not push it away, but if we will embrace it, then it is in the silence of God 
that we can learn that even when we cannot see God, even when we cannot hear God, God is still present and is still at work. While many of you in here this morning were enjoying Laity Sunday at the church last week, my wife Carol and I went up to Raleigh, North Carolina to be with my daughter and her family. My daughter had been involved in a very minor boating accident and as a result had strained her back. And so Carol and I went up to be with her, with our son-in-law, and to try and help with the kids. One night when we were put the, putting the children to bed, I crawled into the bed with my five-year-old grandson, Max. And as any parent knows, those moments can be very tender ones, ones in which all sorts of conversations can take place. At one point, as we were laying there, Max said to me, you know, no one can see the face of God. Now, that is just the kind of conversation that a preacher loves to have, a theological conversation with a five-year-old. And I said, is that right? He said, yes, no one can see the face of God. And I paused for a moment and I said, well, Max, I think you're right. I, I, I'm not sure anyone can see the face of God, but I said, you know, I believe we can see what God has done. For example, I said, suppose tomorrow you take a nap and someone comes to mow the grass. Now, you wake up after that person has gone. I said, you will not have seen the person who mowed the grass. But I said, you will know that someone came to mow the grass. I said, I think it's that way with God sometimes. And then I said, do you understand what I mean? And he said, are we going to the park tomorrow? <laughs> so much for theological conversation. But the point is, just because God is silent, it does not mean that God is absent. In fact, I would remind you that it was when Jesus experienced the silence of God, when he hung on the cross and felt most abandoned by God, that God was actually doing his greatest work. And what was true for Jesus may be true for you as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.